All right, and welcome everybody to Creativity Conversations. This is episode seven, and I am so delighted to have the lovely and talented Maria, Marina Galan with me. And for those of you who haven't been on this call before, I wanted to do this series because so many people think creativity is a talent that is reserved for the artistic. And I've discovered, and have many of the people on this call also discovered that creativity is who we are and it's part of our nature. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. And Marina, I'm going to read your bio and we'll just see what happens after that. Marina is a coach and consultant in Mexico who works with individuals, groups, and organizations all over the world. And she writes, in the journey to find something that would help people not only improve performance in every area of life, but that would actually help them have a richer and deeper experience of it, I came across a simple yet profound truth about human beings and realize that the main reason why we struggle is that we don't fully understand how our experience of life is created and therefore have no clear idea of how to improve it. Few people realize that our mind is naturally oriented towards well-being. Creativity and success, even fewer, have come to develop a close, fruitful relationship with it. Understanding our mind, knowing how to align with it and its infinite resources allows us to explore the very depths of our true potential and consequently experience a more vibrant, engaged, fulfilling life. So you offer so many things to people. You offer coaching, mentoring, training, consulting, even mediating. So how about if we just start by taking a look behind the curtain, so to speak. And first of all, what is it about the mind and our experience of life that lends itself to creativity? Okay. Well, first of all, having me here, thank you for the invitation. I am enjoying it very, very much already. The finding of the unknown. <laughs> So, what is it about the mind and creativity? To me, creativity is an absolutely natural and unstoppable process. Like, we cannot escape it. We are always, always, always creating. And somehow it, it sounds to me like, you know, the world has created this idea of creativity as a specific thing out there that you can get to and you can become good at and you can exercise and you can exploit. But in reality, we, we miss the fact that creativity is the very essence of our experience. Like we are in a process of creativity all the time. It is not interrupted. Ever. Not when we are awake, not when we are asleep, not even when we are unconscious. Isn't that amazing? It is amazing. So for someone who's never heard what you're just saying now, how would they notice that? How would they begin to notice? Okay, first of all, let's go back to the beginning. <laughs> oh boy, that's pretty far back. Okay, so the concept of identity is a created concept in our consciousness. And so but on from the moment we create an identity, we attach to it all sorts of things like, I am not a creative person. But that in itself is a creation. Do you see? Every decision process that we make is a creative process, regardless of whether we are you know, uh, cheering ourselves on to something or talking ourselves out of something. That is a complete creative process in and out of itself. We reach a decision by creating a whole process to get there. Yes? So, yes. 
um, understanding the nature of creativity as it is presenting itself, as it is always happening, opens our eyes to a new reality in which we can actually see in real time our own creations and how that is happening by our mind. So that every experience is being created through us here and now. And we are inevitably collaborating with that. Inevitably. So there are no techniques or tools or tips or strategies that make that more evident? Well, here's the thing. It is so prevalent that it becomes invisible. And so in reality, the only technique, if you want to call it that way, the only possibility to become aware of it is becoming aware of it, <laughs> noticing it, like just starting to see how it is that it is getting created, realizing that. Right? So yeah. we, we tend to believe that our thoughts are ours. <laughs> Not only ours, we tend to believe that our thoughts are us. And, and in reality, if you, if you kind of look at it closely, if you observe it closely, you will see that every thought that you have is in reality a thought that is suddenly, suddenly there and you are just becoming conscious of it. Like it is not you who are creating the thought. It is there and you become aware of it. It is being created in you. Yes? So I, I totally, you're, you're preaching to the choir with me. And <laughs> one of the, the things that I've seen this most directly uh, even though it is an artistic reference, is when I'm creating something with paper and paint or writing something, is that it's, it seems to me that we're much more of a channel than a, well, not even a channel. I think we can even go further than that, that that's who we are and we're giving it a, a vessel or a form for it to be expressed. Absolutely. Yeah. So you see, so here's the thing. If you understand the uh, inevitable process of creativity, the natural process of creativity that you are a part of, it becomes such a delight to be able to, the word you used, express it. There is no need to construct anything. There is no need to invent anything. It's just an expression of that creativity that is always happening. And that is especially wanting to happen through us, right? So the way a thought or an idea can be expressed through me is completely different from the way it could be expressed through anyone here. So that in the creation process, we inevitably taint the creation with what is unique in us. So I have a question here. What's the difference between tainting it and flavoring it? Do you know what I mean? No, I'm not sure I do. Okay, so tainting it to me has a negative connotation. Oh, there you go. Like a filter. <laughs> I mean, and a flavor is the marina flavor or the nina flavor and it's not necessarily bad it's just our way of expressing of course it's not necessarily bad i think it's interesting that you mentioned that taint given that it's a completely neutral thing <laughs> has a negative connotation to you so you see the flavor yes exactly <laughs> i'm the <laughs> guinea pig <laughs> yeah so it's, it's, yeah. you can call it whatever you want. You can call it tainting or flavoring or infusing it even, right? But as long as we are just in, here's the beauty of it. As long as we are in the process of expressing, we, the starting point of expression is wholeness. 
Mm. His absoluteness. Everything is there to be expressed. You see? Yeah. Whereas when you are trying to get something or get somewhere, the starting point is a, is a place of lack. Mm. It's a place of attaining. Do you see? Yes. Yes. When you are expressing, and this is, this is true not only in the arts, this is true in sports, in relationships, in games, in everything. Where, when you begin the journey from a place of wholeness and completeness, only expression is possible. Yeah. This reminds me of the Sufi understanding of life, you know, like where the Sufis realize that everything is complete, the whole process is complete and we are just remembering. And so there is nothing left to do except celebrate. And the way they celebrate is through expressing art. So every Sufi is an artist. They're poets and painters and musicians and all sorts of things. But their only goal is expressing that wholeness, yeah. that completeness. Through the never-ending process of creativity that we are involved in, you know, even their dance is a whole symbolism of the process of creation, where they hold one hand up yeah. to receive and the other hand down to give. And the whole path is through the heart. You see the flavor and the infusion? Yes. <laughs> and they tilt their heads to the side so that the ego doesn't get too much in the way, so the rational doesn't get too much in the way. <laughs> and they spin as a, as a metaphor of this possibility of creation. And That's a bit of a paradox, understanding ourselves as both the creatures and creators. So can I take this conversation back to what you had said earlier about um, creativity and identity and how we create our identity? And so many people are on a spiritual quest to find themselves or realize themselves. And it seems to me this understanding that you're sharing is such a 180 degree change because so many people think that we have, we have to create it, we have to make it happen, we have to do practices to be who we really are rather than to understand that we already are who we are. And again, as you put it with the Sufi analogy, that's, we're always expressing it. So you see who we really are is prior to identity. Identity is our first creation. And from the moment of that creation, then even our perception of life and the world is somehow filtered through that I, through that first creation of identity. But if you look at the development of any human being and you go be before identity, you will see that there is experience happening. There is emotion, there is expression, there is creativity. All things are happening already. But then identity is created. And then every experience starts becoming attached to that identity. But identity is just a story. It's the story that we tell ourselves about who we are. But that's all it is. There's no solidity to it. Like right now, identity only exists in your mind. That's it. So stop the search. Stop the identity creation and see what's really there. Well, I, I wish it were that simple. <laughs> <laughs> 
I wish it were that simple, Nina, but here's the thing, uh, creation of identity, creation of concepts, creation of belief is not preventable. It happens and we only become aware of it once it has happened. So we cannot prevent it, right? But we can become aware of it and then give it away. Yes? So it all comes down to becoming more conscious, noticing more? Well, yeah. That is why consciousness is the big game changer. Noticing more what is happening as it is happening. You know, you kind of, you start catching on to it faster. <laughs> I was recently part of a, and at least a couple of people here have heard this story, but I was recently part of, of a conversation about forgiveness. And as we were gathering, we were asked, everything you already know about forgiveness, please don't bring it to the table. Every experience you already had about forgiveness, just leave it out. Let this be a completely creative exploration, right? So everybody was kind of quiet and not really knowing what to say. And, uh, so we had to wonder, you know, like, well, if, if forgiveness isn't what I know about it, what could it be? What else could it be? And the exploration began and people started, you know, dropping all these amazing ideas that were coming to their minds. And, and we were all so excited, like seeing this concept come to life before our eyes. And it was mind blowing, you know, forgiveness as an interpersonal thing in which we were guiding each other it was beautiful. And after the conversation was over, I found myself you know, the rest of the afternoon revisiting my life through a new understanding of forgiveness and saying, oh yes, that makes sense. That was absolutely beautiful. And now I could, and at some point I saw it. I saw that my mind was creating a new concept about what forgiveness was. And I laughed at myself <laughs> <laughs> because I realized that if I kept it, from then on, that would need to be my experience of forgiveness. And if I was having a different experience, I would not be able to call it forgiveness. <laughs> <laughs> I would not allow myself to forgive. Do you see? Yes. And so I thanked my mind for the beautiful process it was <laughs> bringing, but I gave away the concept immediately. And in that moment, I realized that Every single experience of forgiveness I have had in my life has been completely different to the next one. Completely different. And I realized that forgiveness, like pretty much everything else, everything else, is something that can only happen now. And it requires radical presence. If you give away all your concepts, all your beliefs, everything, and you just become present to the moment, you will read the moment in a completely different way. And the moment will inform your wisdom how to deal with it. And so your wisdom will guide you through the moment in the most elegant, gracious, beautiful way possible. Mm -hmm. But there is a need to give away, cleanse ourselves of our concepts, of our beliefs, of becoming empty so that the new can come through us. So there's that uh, image of the Sufi with the taking in and the, <laughs> <laughs> the letting go at the same time. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm remembering a story now. My cousin heard there was an amazing, very old carpenter hidden in the Mayan jungle. And she 
went and got a piece of wood and brought it with her, took it to the carpenter and asked him to make a table. But she wanted the table, you know, like this and like that, and this were the measures and this was the shape. And the old carpenter smiled at her and said, thank you, come back in a couple of weeks. <laughs> and when she came back, she found a completely different table and she was really upset. Like, what the hell, this is not the table I asked for. And the Mayan carpenter smiled and said, no, this is what it asks for. And they had this exchange of, no, 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 what do you mean it asked for? I am the client, I am asking for something completely different. Mm. And, the, and the, the carpenter said, well, if you wanted a table like that, you should have brought me a piece of wood that asked for that. <laughs> you see? That's perfect. But do you see the radical presence of the carpenter? Yeah. Sitting in absolute conversation with a piece of wood. Yeah to reach a much deeper understanding of what was possible, of what wanted to come through, of what wanted to be created through him and this piece of wood coming together. But we go back to that, empty yourself of concepts, become absolutely present and see what it asks for. Yes. It being the table, the piece of wood, the person in front of you, your partner, uh, your art creation, or whatever, just become fully present. And here's the thing, when we become fully present and empty, it's very confusing to the rational mind because the role of the rational mind is to control and plan you know, and, and keep you safe. So we are very drawn to that sense of safety that can bring the known to the rational mind. But if, if you observe, again, the development of a human being, you will see that we are perfectly designed to thrive in the unknown. Like, look at a baby. They know nothing. They are in absolute trust of life and the universe and whoever is in front of them. And they thrive. They are just completely empty and exposed and happy. Yeah. They are in experience of the essence of well-being. We are explorers by nature. But the nature of exploration is not in the realm of the known. It is, by definition, in the realm of the unknown. And that is where we thrive. We just don't know it. And so we exchange that for the comfort of an illusion of control from the rational mind. Yeah. We limit our life until we are only in relationship to concept and not in relationship to life. Yeah. And so we are so, so constrained that we become bored suddenly. <laughs> and, you know, uh, we, we live that the persons, that's what the persons around us, we are not present to them. We have an idea of who they are, and that is what we are in relationship with. Yeah. And then when we do something completely out of that, we, we get upset and we get mad, and this is so unlike you, you know? And what about my expectations? Yeah. No, this person in front of you is not the same person that was in front of you last week. Just like the tree outside your window is not the same tree that was there last week but you, you have entered a relationship with a concept and not with life. You have lost presence and you have lost your freedom in the name of an illusion of control and comfort that is on top of that, not real. <laughs> it's such a, it's such a um, 
a wonderful exploration that you're sharing with us. And, you know, we can see it so much around us where everything becomes transactional. It's a checklist. It's not alive. And I think only when, when any of us get to the point where we're saying, really, is this it? Is this all that I, that's here for me? That that can be the springboard into a whole new way of living life and realizing that all of the baggage that we've been carrying with us, all the way we thought things should be or people should be or behave is irrelevant. And it's getting in our way of allowing that question of what wants to come through what wants to be expressed, which are two of my favorite questions. Absolutely. But you see, so concepts cannot be expressed because they're dead already. They are fixed already. Yeah. So how, how can that come to life in a creation that needs to happen now? It can't. It would be just a repetition of a repetition of a repetition. <laughs> So I've been reading a book called uh, The Highest Goal by Michael Ray. And the tagline of the book is the secret that sustains you in every moment. And I think that's actually a tagline for this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. It will. It may be. But you see, uh, Nina, the interesting thing about getting trapped in your own world of concepts and becoming bored by that and, and, you know, stale. You get to that point of, really? Is this all there is? And then you become like a, like a, a extreme experience junkie. You go looking for more. You know, you, you need, I don't know, bungee jumping or sabotaging a relationship or any of the above instead of just becoming present to the magnificence of life now and rediscovering the tree and rediscovering the person in front of you and rediscovering yourself and forgiveness and breakfast <laughs> and anything you know flavors yeah. whatever and in this um becoming conscious of what we are doing to ourselves as we enclose our lives to this concept world. We realize that we are ultimately free. Absolutely, irrevocably free. We are so free that we are free to engage ourselves in a world of concept and thought. That is how free we are, isn't it? That blows my mind. <laughs> you know, like, do you want to do this to yourself? Sure. They will, the skies will never open and a finger will never come out of it saying, that is not the right way to suffer. <laughs> <sighs> you can do it the way you want. And the entire universe is contemplating you in absolute respect. Talk about creation, right? I was just going to underscore that word, creation, creativity, permission, freedom. It's the essence of everything, but we are free to create shackles and prisons and whatever. And Which heavens is and yeah. yeah. Yeah, we can create hell. <laughs> and we often do. We often do. <laughs> yeah, constantly. Constantly. Yeah. And so, come terms with the fact that you are the creator of your experience in any given moment. Just because you attached yourself to a concept and held it as truth makes it absolutely ridiculous. And so, this idea of giving it away. For me, it has become the very essence of offering. Mm -hmm. I offer the creation of my mind 
in exchange for a new experience. For life. I offer myself in exchange for the unknown. That is a good trade. <laughs> <laughs> and, and think about it. And I was discussing this yesterday uh, with someone. Everything you know has gotten you here, but it can't take you any further. If you want to go further, you have to look at what you don't know. And the best way to do that, truly, fully, is to let go of what you know. Because otherwise, what you know becomes the filter through which the unknown can touch you. Yeah. Through which life can touch you. And we are missing so much through those filters, those unconscious filters. But I'm not going to refer to that as tainting. Because that's just a concept too. There you go. But, <laughs> but you made the concept a bad concept in your head and now you don't want to use it. That's a lot of fun experience. Cool. Go for it. You're free to do that. Yeah. Yeah. But hey, you, in potentiality, you hold every possible experience of tainting anyone has ever had in the history of humanity or will ever have. Don't attach to one. Why? <laughs> oh, that's lovely. Uh, we are about halfway through our call, and what I'd love to do is open the conversation up to anyone who is listening. And we have you muted at the moment, so if you raise your digital hand by going to the participants box, you'll see an opportunity where you can raise your little blue digital hand and we'll call on you. Come on, be expressions. That's it, okay. Uh, Gary. I, I couldn't sit here and hold it in concept. I had to say it. Hi, um, <laughs> I had to say it before it became a concept. I, no, I was fascinated earlier when you were talking about how uh, concept shuts down creativity and how it gets in the way of seeing anything new. Um, but there was something else in there that I heard, and I'm, I'm sort of trying to recapture it now. I'm sorry, it all got lost because I've been so paying such rapt attention to what's going on, because this is really a fascinating, wonderful conversation. Um, yeah, it's, I know what it was, that we value the output of creativity, the product, so much that we devalue the process, and the process is all that's valuable. The outcome is just, it's like exhaust. It's just a byproduct, you know? But we, 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 the outcome you can give away. Pardon me? The outcome you can give away. Yeah, yeah. Which reminds me of a quote I heard in a movie. It was a, a, a movie with Omar Sharif. He was playing, when he was an old man, he was playing uh, a shopkeeper and he was playing a Jew, even though he's a, an Egyptian or was an Egyptian. And he, he had a, a relationship started with a little boy a Palestinian boy who came and stole from his shop and they became wonderful friends. And then like a father has said, it's a lovely movie. And at one point as a lesson, he tells the boy, what you give away is yours forever. What you keep is lost. And that just got seared into my brain. I just love that. It's the thing I remember most about the movie. And that's kind of what you were talking about to me. I just love that. It's a beautiful quote. I love it. The thing is that, and I'm going to underscore this again, you know, the process is, is so prevalent it, because it is always happening. We miss it. And so we become enamored by the product, by the outcome. And that's what we want to keep because that is our creation. You see? And for, take businesses, for example. They get so caught up in their heads about the vision. 
right? And we have to have a clear vision. And they miss the fact that the vision is not in the object seen. Mm -hmm. It's in the capacity of vision. That is the vision. But if I am going to, you know, grade the quality of my vision according to the object seen, I am missing the point. And by judging the, 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 the whatever is being created, you're squelching it. You're cutting off its life if you're judging it while it's coming out. Absolutely. I've, I've found myself doing that. And then, well, why am I doing that? I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to give something birth and kill it at the same time here, you know? Absolutely. I was reading a poem yesterday that said, uh, uh, the eye is the loneliest creation because it doesn't hold anything. Mm. It is always empty. And I love that, you know, because to me, it's not empty at all. It's just, that's where the good stuff is happening. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you. Like next up is Martin. Hi, Martin. Hello. Hi, Nina. Hi, Marina. Thank you guys so much. And uh, I was emailing Nina earlier this week, and and the way that she described you, Marina, I, I haven't met you yet, but she uh, she told me to get on the call because you're you're easy to fall in love with, and uh, I <laughs> thought that was uh, that was just a great way to describe it, and. Uh, this conversation has proven that uh, that she was definitely right. That was <laughs> that was uh, a great a great conversation. I'm and, glad uh, you think so, Martin. I'm glad I didn't disappoint you. <laughs> <laughs> no, not not even a little bit. Um, what I found that was so interesting was when you said the person you see in front of you is not the the same person you you saw last week or the week before or whatever. And uh, I feel like when you talk to people, so many the response to like, how are you? They're always, a lot of people just say, oh, you know, like the same old or, you know, something along those lines, like nothing new and exciting. And and now I feel like the way that you were talking that that's just such a terrible way to look at things. <laughs> and I, I feel like I, I can't say that anymore. <laughs> you can't. <laughs> you know, I, I, I see marriages, you know, like I'm so disappointed. He's not the guy I married anymore. Well, of course not. You're not the same person either, thank God, right? But it's, it's in the discovery of who we are becoming, of who we are right now, that we can, again, fall in love and have a completely new experience of the person. But again, it requires radical presence and letting go of everything. Because if I if I understand people with dark eyes as enemies, my experience of you, Martin, would be a fear and rejection and, you know, be very aware, be very alert. But I would miss the fact that it is my belief that is creating my experience of you. My belief is my process, is, is, in, is engaged in my process of creation of experience. And that makes presence really difficult. It interferes with presence. It interferes with being here and now. Yeah, that makes so much sense. That's that's amazing. I feel like once I leave this this call, it's just going to be a new uh, new way of seeing things. So I, I appreciate that. Yes, Martin, but I am, I'm, I'm going to give you one more thing. <laughs> Please. <laughs> yes, all that with the person in front of you, but yes, all that with yourself. Because you are not who you think you are. You cannot be. Wow. So how, how, how do you look past that, that identity? I, that's like, that's just like crazy. <laughs> I don't know how to do that. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, here's the thing. Concepts and beliefs and stuff are like leper hounds. They run away if you stare at them for long enough. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. So I'm gonna share with you how I, how, I, how I teach this to little kids. Is that okay, Martin? Please. Okay. I bring a ton of Lego bricks. And on every Lego brick, I write something like handsome or ugly or well-behaved or bad-mouthed or, you know, anything, shy. And I ask them to build themselves so that, so that later on in the, in the conversation, their identity becomes very visible to them, yes? So they build themselves up. And then we have a tiny chat about essence and truth and how for something to be essential and true, it has to always be present and be true for everyone. And so then we go brick by brick. So are you always bad mouthed? No. Okay, so we can take this away. And are you beautiful to every single person? Well, no. So we take that away. And so we we end up deconstructing the identity until they realize that every brick is theirs to use whenever it's necessary, but they will never be the bricks. They are the space in which the game happens. But the space is empty and clean and it can never be attached to a brick. It can never be touched or made anything less by the bricks. Wow, that's amazing. Makes sense? Yeah, absolutely. I love the way that you just said all that. Thank you. Cool. Thank you, Martin. That was fun. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Martin. I love your reference to who we are as the space in which everything is happening. Because it doesn't seem like it can be anything else when you start to discard the concepts and the assumptions and the expectations. Yes. Yeah. When you understand yourself as a blank page, it, it, living from any other space stops making sense. Why would I limit myself to that? Yeah. And yet today, you know, when you say, hi, how are you? Who are you? You give the story. You give the whole story. I am a shy person who is very uncomfortable in this type of situations, you know, speaking in front of people that I don't know. Yeah, well, that's not true. That's not true. That can be the experience I am having right now. But that will never be me. Never. And we, we are so hard on ourselves and on others. You know, I am damaged goods. I lived through all this. I have these thoughts and these feelings. And that means about me a world just made up it, that is being created in the moment such a gift yeah. we have another uh, person with a question it's Karina hi Karina welcome Karina hi I'm so sorry I missed the first 15 minutes I literally just came across um, this on on when I was checking my Facebook feed so I'm so glad that um, I caught it. Um, it's, it's very timely for me um, and the whole question of concepts um, because I've just been made redundant this morning. And so to me, there's, there's a whole lot of thinking a concept around, you know, redundancy. And um, I loved what you said about, you know, don't attach yourself to the concept of how things should be or, you know, what all that sort of meaning of what it is to lose something and your life, you know, your income. Um, 
what else did I love? I, I, it's just inspirational of, um, yeah, that the power of the unknown without the concept of what's possible to be created. Um, because for me, jumping to fear is, is, is maybe the, the first reaction, but then just stepping back and knowing that there is all of this inside that's just waiting to see what, what will come out and what will be created from this new space that I've been gifted. Um, so I don't know if you had anything um, to, to add um, around that, because I'm sure a lot of people are sort of facing similar situations with the economy at the moment. Um, <clears throat> And creation becomes more sort of like almost like oh there's there's something that has to be created rather than just allowing it to come yeah how do i do that yeah 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 god thank you for touching on that Darina. that's that's beautiful and timely so there was a, a very famous business book a few years back that one of one of the quotes in it became like famous globally, you know, and it said, the best way to predict the future is to create it. Do you remember that? Yeah, that's cool. But we never, we were never taught how to create the future. That's the whole thing. And the future never gets here, so it cannot be created. That's yeah. the whole point. Yeah. Now, when we become radically present, like the carpenter in the, in the wood. And we allow the moment to inform us, and then we allow ourselves to be informed by wisdom. We are operating under the best possible option, mm -hmm. you see? Mm -hmm. Because then the world, and I am going to use this word very intentionally, then what is needed is not tainted, by my thinking and my concepts and what I think should be, right? So I become present to the moment. I respond only to this moment. But responding from that space allows the best possibility to be created right then and there. And that is how you create the future, by creating this moment at your best possibility. You see, we tend to think of the future in terms of absoluteness. So I, I cannot move until I know. It's like I have to see the whole staircase before I can take the next step. Because I don't know if this next step is going to take it, you know? Mm -hmm. and we don't. We only have this. Life, life is like driving through a very, very dark forest with very low headlights. <laughs> like you can just see two yeah. meters away. You cannot see further than that. Mm -hmm. But that does not stop you from moving on. Mm -hmm. and how any idea that you make or you create or you invent or you project about the possible future is a map that may or may not be true, may or be not, may not have anything to do with reality. And so you can have the map, but you need to be able to respond to the territory. We live in territories and territories are ever changing and they are always unknown. So yes, the mind will create the map, let it mm -hmm. offer it in exchange for the territory. Because otherwise, driving through the map becomes very, very dull. Yes? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was reading a story recently in which a bicycle rider was training for a very extreme competition, kind of like the Tour de France. Mm -hmm. And he trained like no one. And when the race began, he flew and left everyone behind. And he was so happy, enjoying the ride. And at some point, he was coming down this hill. And this was like the moment, right? He was just enjoying it, letting himself go. And then all of a, all of a sudden, a crane swoops down and flies in front of him. And he gets really scared and startled, and he stops. 
and he's so dumbfounded that every racer starts going past him. And so years later, someone is interviewing him and asks him, so what made you lose a race? And he says, I didn't lose a race, I left it. Because when I found that crane, that encounter with the crane opened something up in me that I had been searching for my whole life. That was my race. If I had known that, I would, that what I was looking for had to do with cranes, I would have gone to zoos, not trained for a race. Mm. But wisdom talks, talks to us in mysterious ways. So it, it, it puts the desire in us, you see, mm -hmm. to go find the race, to train for the race but it may have nothing to do with the race. So you can trust your efforts way more than you can trust your results. Yes. Mm, so in these times of uncertainty, where we are forced to realize that, oh man, the truth is that uncertainty is all there ever was. Like we never knew, we thought we did, we had a map, mm. but we didn't know. And so we are forced with uncertainty. Come to terms with it. Look it in the eye. Mm -hmm. This is your companion in the journey. Mm. But you are perfectly equipped to deal with it. And not only deal with it, but thrive in it. Mm. Because you are informed by wisdom and you are an expression of the wholeness and the possibility. So listen to those whispers inside. Listen to those what wants to come through me. I just really feel like painting. I really feel like swimming. I really feel like planting a tomato plant. I don't know. <laughs> Whatever it is. Yeah. yeah. Trust that. Because if you trust what you think should be the construct of your ideal world based on past ideas and projections, you're missing life. Mm -hmm. Life came out to play today. Yeah. Also. Yeah. I, I did feel that. I felt the, the openness of possibility, you know, like, ooh, what's, what's next? What's coming next? Um, but then the mind goes in, oh, you've been used to, you know, set income and now, you, you know, and then, and then the mind starts trying to play safe, limited with concepts. You should have a set income going on. Self-employed is uncertain. But yeah, well, you know. Stay before the butt. Honey. Yeah. Stay before the butt. Yeah. And also something else. We are so used to thinking of, you know, creativity and inspiration as positive movement. Hmm. And we, we are only seeing part of it. Like, for example, this morning I was very inspired to rest. <laughs> you see? Mm -hmm. But we don't see that as inspiration. We see that as a lack of inspiration. Mm -hmm. But it's not true. When we are called to rest, that is inspiration also. When we are called to stop, you know how waves are formed, how they, they gather up and they gather up and they gather and that's all they do. They gather until they cannot gather no more and then there is an expression of that gathering. When? When the shore makes itself present, when it's time. And we human beings, we go through stages of gathering and stages of delivering. You see, you cannot give birth before the whole process is done. You have to gather. You have to let it happen before it can come into the world. And if you bring it out into the world prematurely, it may not survive the world. 
And we are all so worried, especially in times like this of so much uncertainty where there's, you know, you need to know, what are you gonna do? How are you gonna do it? When? And we miss the part of the process in which we need to gather, we need to stop, we need to take in mm -hmm. until it makes sense to bring out. Beautiful. It's all part of the process, isn't it? Again, it's back to that exploration, the adventure of it all, and the and the time scales are a, a concept, and we don't know, and it happens when it yeah when it happens. Beautiful. That's really helpful. Thank you so much. So painters, when they're not creating, they spend their times in galleries and museums and stuff, right? Mm -hmm. I used to live with a painter, and it got really frustrating for me. Like you're not working, you know? We're going hungry. <laughs> And it took me a while to understand that he was working. It was part of the process, essential part of the process. So in times like this, a lot of people are being called to rest and gather, but because there is such a wrong connotation about it, we force ourselves out of that state prematurely. So trust you, mm -hmm. give yourself anything you need, radical presence, radical kindness. It's what we all need. Does that make sense, Karina? Does that answer you? Absolutely, question? absolutely. And you know, my reaction was very calm, peace of mind, and, and I just then noticed Oh, I shouldn't be, you know, and, and so it's just like, oh, it doesn't matter. Just stay in this wonderful place because this is where we're most open. So all of that was, was was so helpful just to be reminded of. And yeah, thank you. And that resting and that waiting for inspiration and cultivating. Yeah. Cool. Really cool. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, like this time, so many people are coming out of it saying, Oh, I've realized this is not the job I want. What I want to do is I don't know, teach kids, or no, this is we didn't yeah. have time to realize that, and now we did. And sometimes I think, you know, the universal God or whatever it, um, wants, gives us a little nudge, a little push, you know, because, yeah, sometimes it's an opening that's, that's, that we just weren't brave enough to take. Um, I don't know, that's probably a, maybe a concept, but, um, yeah. That's lovely. Thank you, Karina. You know, I want to say one more thing, Nina, if I may. I know we're reaching the top of the hour, but I'm just... It's just a concept. It's just a concept. Okay. <laughs> Let's create more time out of nothing, <laughs> suddenly. <laughs> you know how we tend to separate ourselves from life? We were talking about this yesterday. We tend to separate ourselves from life the way we separate ourselves from nature you know like there's nature and there's me and how do i help nature and and we do the same with wisdom and we do the same with life like it's me and life and can i trust it and we miss the fact that we are part of the same thing we are made of life and nature and wisdom and inspiration. We are it. And every, we are so good at seeing how everything is being guided, you know, how roots are being guided to humidity and flowers are being guided by light and, I don't know, rain is being guided by gravity and whatever. We see guidance and wisdom everywhere. But when we separate ourselves from that, we miss it in us. And then we start ruling ourselves by concepts instead of allowing us to be brought forward by the force of life and wisdom and inspiration that is all that is ever going on here in the world. Thank 
Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much, Marina. Where can people find you when you're not talking with me? They can find me in Querétaro. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, marinagalan.com. Marinagalan.com, they can reach me there. Lovely. Thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to spend time with you. Thank you so much, Nina. It's been, it's been a real treat. Very creative. <laughs> <laughs> this oh. and this, or this. <laughs> tilt the head, tilt the head. <laughs> thank you, and thank you everyone for joining us. Bye. Bye for now. I'm cutting. <laughs> JJ.